My book, The Saturn Myth, published by Doubleday in 1980, began the reconstruction of a spectacular formation formerly seen in the sky, a gathering of planets looming immense above the ancient witnesses. I was working with the mythic archetypes, cultures everywhere using different words and different symbols to describe eerily similar events. But the planetary model presented in the Saturn myth was far from complete. Amongst the greatest of enigmas was the cosmic wheel recorded by every ancient culture. Images of a wheel in the sky carved on stone are older than civilization itself. Many archaeologists see these wheels as an imagined vehicle of the sun rolling across the sky. But in its most common form, the cosmic wheel doesn't go anywhere. Often it rests on a stationary pillar, or atop a stairway, or ladder, or is turned by a rope while resting on an altar or table. And the spokes of the wheel are not functional as such. They are fluid and etheric. Archaic gods and heroes hold a wheel in their hands. A cosmic wheel served as the throne of gods and cultural heroes and wise men, symbolically replicated in the wheel thrones of kings on earth. The wheel throne of Buddha underscores our point. And even the popular footprint of Buddha recalls the same wheel in heaven. The inspiration did not come from our sun. Compare these prehistoric instances of the pictographic wheel from Ireland and from California. Different parts of the wheel are clearly evident. A large circle or sphere, though not always present, a central star, and a smaller, darker circle or sphere inside the star-like form. The images do not depict a single object, but three objects, as demonstrated here, where the artist placed the small dark sphere well below the central star. I can assure you that the placements are not random. These forms in the sky were planets in close congregation and immense above the ancient sky worshippers. The stories begin with the appearance of this celestial formation, heaven, when heaven was close to the earth. The original unity of the sky formed by the great conjunction when a straight line or arrow could pierce the hearts of the gathered powers. The motionless superior sun ruling before the present sun. The father of kings and first in the mythic line of kings and a dying or displaced god. In later times, the first astronomers identified this overarching ruler of the sky. They claimed it was the planet Saturn, remembered as the owner of the cosmic wheel before the god departed for distant realms. The astronomical traditions also named the central star as Venus, the mother goddess and they named the darker, reddish sphere as the planet Mars, the cosmic warrior. In these three hours, I intend to demonstrate that the stories of the gods are the stories of what happens to these celestial bodies. You're looking at reconstructed images of a formation in the heavens just a few thousand years ago. The configuration evolved through many phases, evoking reverence and awe, a model for kings and kingdoms for thousands of years. Great temples and cities and sacred mountains all pointed back to the mythic age of gods and wonders.
Let the world's first astronomers point the way for us. They knew that what the myths and hymns and prayers called gods were planets and aspects of planets. Planets appeared close to the Earth in a heaven-spanning configuration. Memories of that celestial splendor still surround us, even if humanity later forgot much more than it remembered. Reconnecting with our forgotten past will be essential. Essential for our own cultural integrity. Essential for the study of human consciousness. And essential for all of the sciences. Just a few thousand years ago, our ancestors witnessed a gathering of planets close to the Earth. An explosion of human imagination occurred, an outpouring of mythology and symbolism that defined cultures for thousands of years long after the celestial provocation itself was forgotten. In these early historical times, there are no records of the present planets, no diaries recording planetary motions or periods, Planets as we know them today did not exist. These were the gods, awe-inspiring, and at times capricious and terrifying. Early star worshipers speak of a great light of heaven, motionless in the sky, the Egyptian Atum or Atum Ra, the Sumerian An, the Babylonian Anu. And enigmatically, early astronomers knew the overarching figure as the planet Saturn, whose story will be a centerpiece of our third episode. In the beginning, the gathered powers were not seen as separate gods, but as the primeval unity of heaven the perfect conjunction, or great conjunction of the Golden Age. A massive sphere hung in the sky, and in its center stood a radiant star surrounded by explosive streamers. Cultures the world over came to see this star in feminine terms as the mother goddess, the planet Venus. Remembered as the great star, the mother of all stars. This was the central eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun, his animating life, power, and glory, and much more. One of the most enigmatic cultural themes is the transformation of the life-giving goddess into a monstrous form, attacking the world. This was the terrible goddess, raging in the sky with wildly disordered hair, or multiple flailing arms, a celestial spectacle radiating a paralyzing light. When instability and displacement occurred, 
The streamers discharging from Venus grew chaotic, giving the planet a frightful countenance. The angry goddess was a comet. The mythic prototype of comets. Emmanuel Velikovsky's great comet, the planet Venus. Seen in front of this central star was a smaller, darker, reddish sphere. This was the mythic warrior, the masculine heart of the heart, the child in the womb, the child on the lap, the pupil of the eye, the axle of the cosmic wheel, the most active figure of world mythology. Sky worshippers everywhere knew the identity of this warrior, the victor over dragons and chaos monsters. This global identity of Mars as the greatest of warriors shouts to us an unrecognized history. On the great sphere of heaven, a bright crescent appeared, with the orb or star of Venus between its horns. Things never seen in our sky were once revered around the world. As the Earth rotated on its axis, the crescent marked out a cycle of day and night. Crescent below in the phase of greatest brightness. Crescent above in the phase of dimming. Though our sun was present, casting its light on the configuration, it was not itself in the visual theater of the gods. I called this the polar configuration because the Earth itself rotated in alignment with the forms in the sky placing these forms at a celestial pole around which the heavens visually turned. The configuration evolved through numerous phases. The number of streamers changed repeatedly, as did their observed form. Every change in relative position produced dramatic changes in the appearance of the configuration. In 1996, the Canadian filmmaker Ben Gad Lowe spent many months in Portland producing a 90-minute documentary on the reconstruction. At that time, many dynamic issues were largely unresolved. But later that year, the Australian physicist Wallace Thornhill flew to Portland for a 30-day visit. He convinced me that the forms I'd reconstructed were electrical. They were plasma discharge streamers stretching between planets. He explained that in a radial electric discharge, both the number of streamers and their concrete form will change with the intensity of the discharge. The whirling forms I'd reconstructed in the common symmetry, which I'd often laughed about, did indeed have a physical explanation. At the time of his visit, Wal Thornhill had devoted more than 25 years to exploring what he called the electric universe. 
His work follows in the traditions of the electrical and plasma science pioneers, who showed that electricity plays a major role in space, that galaxies, stars, and planets are formed electrically, that comets with their bright tails move through an electric field of the sun. His electrical interpretation extended to the origin of bizarre landscapes on planets and moons, now explained by the well-tested principles of electrical arcing. In an electric solar system, if two planets or moons approach each other from regions of different potential, electric discharge will occur, producing plasma formations stretching between the approaching bodies. Plasma laboratory experiments can tell us what the formations might look like. The backbone is typically a column of twisted filaments, but disks and embedded cylinders also arise to evolve in spectacular ways. The counterpart to such formations can be seen in ancient depictions of the cosmic thunderbolt. But what an outrageous idea that exotic formations could arise between planets in close approach. What then was the relationship of the cosmic thunderbolt to the magical swords, arrows, clubs, and spears of the great warrior gods? With a stunning accord, ancient languages identify these weapons as special forms of the cosmic thunderbolt. Scholars have already identified the sword and arrows of Apollo, the spear of Zeus, the trident of Poseidon, as aspects of the divine thunderbolt. The same linkage occurs with the Greek Ares, the Latin Mars, whose sword was his identity. First came the thunderbolt, the core archetype. Then came its mythic interpretation as a weapon of the warrior god. Placed in the hands of the gods, the cosmic thunderbolt provides a bridge for us, joining the mythic world to the leading edge of plasma science. One simple truth will change the future of science and our understanding of human history. The ancient sky bore no resemblance to the sky we see today. Above human witnesses, planetary formations hovered close to the Earth.
one electrical form metamorphosed into another in the celestial dance of the mythic star goddess and the cosmic warrior, astronomically identified as the planets Venus and Mars. Ancient observers saw the head of the warrior king wrapped in the radiance of the star goddess. It was his crown of glory. And it was the warrior's magical protection, worn as a helmet or crest, but much more. The dancing Aztec god wore the rays of Venus as a crest, but also held the so-called half-star of Venus in an outstretched hand. And he even wore this protective radiance as his skirt. The theme is universal. The warrior's armor was the radiance of the great star, and that is the explanation for the unexplained radiant crown of kings. As the forms of the configuration changed, the mythic interpretations changed as well. In pictures and words, the ancient chroniclers recounted the cosmic conjunction of the goddess and the warrior. The goddess was the eye, and the warrior was the pupil of the eye. Two spheres in alignment inspired a mythical interpretation as an eye and pupil inscribed upon the hand of God. The five fingers of the hand were the visible aspects of an eight-spoked wheel in a different phase. Buddhist symbolists knew that the hand bore a secret relationship to the eight-spoked Dharma wheel. Buddha was the motionless axle of the wheel. Enthroned upon the hand of heaven, he was surrounded and protected by the celestial fire of the gods. Every form that arose provoked a variety of mythical interpretations, not just a single idea. The spokes of the wheel were the animating soul and power of the universal sovereign, exploding into life at sunset. That is the meaning of the mythic plant of life. Things seen in the sky provoked hundreds of imaginative images and not one speaks for events in the heavens today, not a single one. Even when the concrete form of the cosmic original was forgotten, the imaginative idea persisted for thousands of years. Innumerable concrete details will not allow us to just make up explanations for the myths and symbols. Some symbols remained abstract, but more often they added mythical interpretation to the underlying form. And many mythical images seemingly incompatible will trace to the same tangible form. The plant of life was not just an attractive design element. It was a form in the sky, inspiring a story of vast influence. In his birth or rebirth, 
The warrior god emerged from the radiant flower. The diverse mythical interpretations and the larger stories told about these events all point to a unified substructure of human memory. A great wheel turned in the heavens, and it was remembered around the world. Even the modest displacement of the aligned powers was captured in ancient images. Why was the Egyptian goddess identified as the headdress of the warrior king? It's the underlying form that gives us the answer. A primeval sun ruled the world, shining most brightly in the night sky. A crescent came to adorn this primeval sun, and it certainly was not our moon. The great star of Venus rested between its horns, and visually seated within the star was the planet Mars. A luminous stream appeared to descend from Mars, the first form of the cosmic thunderbolt. Human imagination saw a sword or dagger thrust into the region below. The warrior god was his sword, envisioned also as an axial pen, peg, or mooring post of the turning sky. The same thing as the stem of the plant of life. and the pillar-like lower limbs of the goddess. The same form in the sky was seen as a protruding tongue of both the warrior and the angry goddess. A pronounced movement of Mars occurred close to, but not precisely on, the planetary axis. Now the celestial crescent appeared as the horns of the warrior himself, in his identity as the Bull of Heaven. And it should not surprise us that the foundation post bore the image of the Bull at its apex. When it reached the earth, the stream presented the form of a great pillar or cosmic mountain. Perhaps it is too much to believe that the famous Bull of Heaven was just a pillar in shining horns. To these events, we will trace the worldwide myths of the heaven-lifting cosmic giant, the first active form of the warrior hero. His upraised arms were precisely the same thing as the horns of the Bull of Heaven, a testament to the integrity of the substructure, the archetypes.
In some phases with the movement of Mars, dust and electrified plasma streaming between Mars and Venus became visible to terrestrial observers. Even small changes in this dusty plasma stream, were we to view the formation from space, would create distinctive differences in the appearance of the configuration. The great kings of ancient times wore conical crowns in numerous and always enigmatic varieties. For these revered forms, the experts can find no referent in nature today. Yet the priestly chroniclers of antiquity knew that these crowns imitated the vestment of a cosmic warrior, the prototype of the warrior king on Earth. With progressive instability and displacement from the axis, the stream joining Mars and Venus spiraled outward. This was the mother goddess herself, the radiant eye, heart, and soul of the primeval sun, now externalized as a curling lock of hair. And the earliest sources leave no doubt that it was a visible form in the sky. The sidelock of the warrior king mimicked that of his predecessor, the cosmic warrior. This curling life breath provoked innumerable symbols, far more than we could include here. Just one example was the mooring post in the sky, signifying the outflow of the eye and the evolving form of creation itself. A critical turn came with the removal of the life breath curl, unleashing the terrible goddess and a cosmic crisis. In his rage, the Hindu Shiva tore out a lock of his hair from which arose his own dark aspect, the monster Virabhadra. And close by the terrifying form of the angry goddess, whom we recognize as the Comet Venus. The Medusa archetype was only a nuance away from the celestial serpent or dragon, with its bright filaments, effusive feathers, long flowing hair, and lightning emanations, the global symbols of the great comet. In Egypt, the eye, heart, and soul of Ra departed from the god to become the fiery Uraeus serpent, rampaging in the heavens. Astronomical traditions throughout the Mediterranean and Near East confirm that this goddess was the planet Venus. The ancient Sumerians identified Venus as Inanna, the serpent or dragon mother, unapproachable in her rage. The disordered comet-like hair of the Chinese dragon was an overriding feature, as was the discharging sphere or so-called night-glowing pearl, its spiraling attributes, and the lightning emanations of the dragon itself. Long after the remembered events, the Aztecs still knew the comet as streaming feathers.
they knew the connection of the comet to a cosmic serpent. And they remembered the connection of both to the planet Venus. From the episodes of disorder, a phase of celestial construction emerged, focused on the activity of the spiraling form, or raid spiral, remembered as the serpent of creation. This was the expanded enclosure of the mother goddess herself, the motherland in the sky, the true subject of the archaic creation legend. The mythic home of gods and heroes lay within an enclosure formed by the body of the celestial serpent or dragon. The evolving forms noted here are provable phases in the biography of the mother goddess largely ignored but confirmed at the level of concrete detail in the early cultures. The priests of ancient Egypt knew that the white crown was the mother goddess. They knew that the life breath curl and the revolving lock of hair were the same goddess. Across all of Egypt, the chroniclers remembered the luminous spiral with its radial projections as the agent of celestial construction. From north to south, they described the goddess, originally the Eye of Ra, taking the form of a flaming serpent, whose hieroglyph means goddess. And it was this very serpent that came to form an enclosure, the boundary of Neterta, the celestial kingdom. Mesoamerican artists understood very well that the fire serpent or dragon enclosing the land of the gods had appeared as a raid spiral. The created land of the gods emerging from the dance of the goddess and the hero presented four streams of light and life. Here was the motherland in the sky, the celestial model for every kingdom and city on earth, the lost land of mythic ancestors, divided by four rivers or animated by four explosive winds and turning as a great wheel in the sky. To be sure, the evolution of myth over time brought endless elaborations of the archetype, Yet even in the enthusiasm to extend the symbolism, the substratum of human memory does shine through. The complexities of the Aztec calendar wheel did not eliminate the axial role of the warrior hero or the four exploding streams of life energy or the circumscribing, often double-headed serpent, or the identity of that serpent as the fire of the gods. As a rule, later spiritual traditions did not displace these human memories either but found in them the symbolic landscape for expressing insights and beliefs that would guide later interpretations of myth. Yeah. 
Lastly, we must acknowledge one of the most pervasive symbols of world mythology. All mythic traditions agree that the land of the gods rested on the golden or fiery mountain of heaven. It is evident that the core symbols of human yearning, suffering, and devotion across the millennia trace to the very events from which the first civilizations themselves arose. Now the question must be asked, if the great mythic archetypes are explained by events unknown to our world, what can the electric universe and the leading edge of plasma science tell us about the ancient experience.